The thing I love about God's word is he is concerned about the everyday issues that we face. And he actually, if you use God's word, it can initiate incredible conversations in your family, if you're married, or as a single, if you're struggling with being a single person, God actually has things to say about you, to you. So in 1 Corinthians 7, we're going to cover singleness or celibacy. And just so you know, celibacy is a term that applies to somebody who is single by choice and they have decided to live sexually pure for their entire lives. Or maybe if they've just become a Christian from this point forward in their lives. So celibacy is a intentional decision to stay single. Paul is going to talk about that. He's talk, going to talk about marriage. He's going to talk about the sexual relationship and the priority of the sexual relationship in marriage. Uh, he's going to talk about divorce and he's going to talk about the specific uh, issue of divorce when you're a believer married to a non-believer. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. And what I want to do as we get started is I want to share with you the context of 1 Corinthians 7, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. So let's read that. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So there are two amazing things that come out of this last verse, last two verses of 1 Corinthians 6. Number one, your body belongs to God. And how you use your body is important to God. All right, your body belongs to God. He purchased you when you became a Christian. He bought your body, okay? The second thing is, is that how you use your body on a day-by-day, year-by-year level is important to God. Now, I want to take you to a second verse, Romans chapter 12, 1. If 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that our bodies belong to God, Romans 12, 1 is a command to acknowledge that by giving God the title deed to your body. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't say present your lives. He focuses on your body. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't let the current of this world sweep you along. And I want to encourage you, by the way, this is just a freebie throwing in. We need to consciously reject the values, the morals, and the wisdom of this world. So when you're listening to Twitter or reading Twitter, realize that Twitter is the devil, okay? It is, it is owned lock, stock, and barrel by the devil. And the wisdom you get there is not going to be godly wisdom unless you happen to have that one in two billion people who are Christians on Twitter, okay? So the, the wisdom you're going to get in social media, the wisdom you're going to get from uh, television, the wisdom you're going to get from the internet is essentially a wisdom that God says, I want you to reject. In fact, Psalm 1 promises a blessing to the person who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And the ungodly, biblically speaking, is anyone who is not committed to following Jesus. So he says, do not be conformed to this world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is a key. Uh, how do we change? We change by changing our thinking from the thinking of this world to the thinking of God as revealed in his word. And when your mind is renewed, your life will be transformed. And then he says that by testing, in other words, by experience in your life, you may discern what the will of God is. It is good and acceptable and perfect. So this is the context. God owns your body. He wants us to acknowledge and surrender the ownership of our body to him by our choice. And now we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now let me explain where we are in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1 through 6 is all about a message that a key family brought to Paul. 
And their message to Paul is, Paul, the Corinthian church is falling apart. There's division. There's a guy living with his stepmother. Christians are suing each other. Mass hysteria. Everything's going wrong, Paul. And so 1 through 6, Paul is addressing these concerns that the household of Chloe brought to Paul. Now in chapter 7, he's going to switch gears. Because at the same time, the Corinthian church wrote a letter to Paul. Because the Corinthians were wackos. They had things, they had views on all sides. They were crazy. And so all of these really radically divergent views, they're writing to Paul and they're saying, hey, we need you to mediate for us. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? And all the way through. So from 1 Corinthians 7.1 to the end of the book, Paul is answering specific questions that the Corinthians uh, had asked him. And the key to understand, he says, verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. So in order to understand this passage, we kind of have to extrapolate and look at the questions that they were asking. And the way we figure that out is by looking at the culture surrounding them and actually looking at Paul's answers and kind of like Jeopardy, what's the question that they asked, all right? Let me give you a little background on Corinth. They were Greek by nature, and one of the dominating perspectives of Greek philosophy is they saw a duality between the spiritual world and the physical world. And in the Greek thinking, the spiritual world was good and the physical world was bad or evil. And there was a break between these two. Now, this fundamental underlying philosophy actually resulted in two crazy divergent views. One view of the Corinthian church was that anything you do to satisfy your body is evil. Sex is evil. No matter when and how you're doing it, sex is bad. So their whole thing is if you're single, don't you even think about getting married. And so this is the kind of people that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy. He said that false teachers are people who forbid marriage. So that was coming up. Then they said, if you're married, whatever you do, don't have sex. And I had professors in seminary who were like this. They said, the only time you should have sex is for procreation. And when you looked at them, you understood why. It was just, you know, <laughs> it was a horrible view. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Made me want to abandon my faith, to be honest. It, it was just, it's a crazy view. And so there were people on that side who just viewed this idea of sex, you know, that God's up in heaven whenever a husband and wife are having sex. They says, cut that out. I wish they wouldn't do that. You know, it's just that God is kind of embarrassed by our sexuality. Paul is going to address that. Then there's this other view that said since your spiritual life is separate from your physical life, it doesn't matter what you do physically. So you can go to prostitutes, you can do any manner of sexual provision you want and it will not affect your spirit because they're separate. So this, it's funny, this one underlying philosophy kind of resulted in two crazy things. So now first of all, Paul is going to address the issue of singleness. Uh, verse 1. So Paul says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now Paul is talking about a single man and a single woman here uh, because he's going to just actually dispute that in verse 2 when he talks about marriage. But I want you to understand what Paul is saying. If you're single here today, you're not weird, you're not a loser, you're not somebody that God is looking at and saying, oh man, why can't you get married? Uh, it is good for a person to be single and not to have sexual relationships, men with women, or any kind of sexual relations. So the, the larger definition of immorality is any sex outside of God's plan for sex and marriage. And so if you're in that category, God says, it's good. And by the way, uh, you know, we're a church that's predominantly families. If you know single people, don't ask them when, when are they going to get married. 
It's, it's a terrible question. Now, unless they're engaged and they're getting married next to you, that's okay. <laughs> but, but what it's implying is, hey, half a person, when are you going to become a real person? So they are single and they are whole people. And what we're going to discover is that in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul actually begins to talk about some great advantages to being single. So being single is not half a person. It's not a person who can't find a spouse. It is a whole person who has a great opportunity to serve Jesus without any distractions, okay? Now notice he says it's good. He doesn't say it's the best. He doesn't say it's terrible. Hey, if you're single and you're living sexually pure, that's a good thing. Now we come to the issue of marriage. He goes, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, we're in verse 2, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but when I first read that, that sounds like a really demeaning view of marriage, doesn't it? Paul says, look, if you can't control yourselves, go ahead and get married, you disgusting people, because you're going to be tempted to sexual immorality and you're going to burn up if you don't, so oh, go ahead and get married. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, the beauty is Paul is acknowledging the reality and the power of normal sexual drives. It is not weird, it's not weakness, it's normal to have powerful sexual drives in you. And Paul says, because of these sexual drives, get married. Because when you get married, you have a way that you can deal with and satisfy those powerful sexual urges in a way that pleases and glorifies God. So he's not demeaning marriage, he's just actually being incredibly realistic. Now he goes on, and he's going to talk about how you do this thing called marriage. <coughs> Verse 3, the husband is to give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to, to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. This was actually my life verse when I was first married. Uh, <laughs> it, it never worked out the way I wanted it to, though, because... Because I said, hey, Connie, that's my body. Get over here. <laughs> and then she would turn to me and she'd say, hey, Steve, that's my body. Get out of here. <laughs> so it just never quite works the way you want it to work. All right? But there, there's something really important here. Paul is saying God cares about your sexual relationship as husband and wife. It is very important to him. It actually is a way that you glorify God with your body by having a sexually satisfying relationship with your husband or your wife. Does that make sense? So, so he's saying, look, wives, your body belongs to your husband to bring satisfaction to him. Husband, your body belongs to your wife to bring sexual satisfaction to her. And we're going to talk about how we need to uh, guard against some excesses of this, but... But the point is, God is saying that you glorify God by having a great sexual relationship with your spouse. It's not, it's not you're giving in to your lower base urges. It's that you are glorifying God with your body when a couple comes together in loving, mutually satisfying sexual union. And that's a very important point. And I just, one of the things I'm going to call for, I think there are times in our marriage when we kind of need to press the reset button because we've gotten into bad habits and bad patterns and maybe out of nothing more than laziness. You know, I, I remember, I think it was Joan Rivers was talking about her husband when they were first married and they would chase each other around the living room Chase me, chase me. Okay, I'm chasing you. And they'd do that. And then after a few years of marriage, he'd say, chase me, chase me. Oh, I'm tired. I'll chase you on Tuesday. And so, you know, it kinda, you kind of lose that new zeal for, for love and for sex and for passion. 
Paul's just simply saying it's important. Now let's go on verse 5 because he's going to give some specifics here of what's very important in a marriage. He says, do not deprive one another. In other words, he's saying, one of you or the other, don't unilaterally decide we're going to stop having sex because I don't like it. If you're going to stop having sex for any reason, for Paul says two things. Number one, do it for a limited time. And number two, do it by mutual agreement. Do you see a little pattern? There's this crazy thing called communication that we need to engage in when it comes to our sexual relationships. Now, it may be that, you know, I mean, the last thing that I want to get up in a fast is, is sex. So, you know, that, but if you're going to pray, you know, for a limited time, that's fine. But Paul says specifically, but then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Satan can use the lack of a healthy sexual relationship to enter into a marriage and bring his will to pass. Guys, do you realize this is crazy that God is saying, this is important, people. Listen. Now, let's go on. We, we've talked about our responsibilities, and I just want to share with you how pro-sex God is. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, and I'm reading this from the message. He says, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between man, wife and husband. God draws a firm line between casual and illicit sex. So Paul says, I love it, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. So before we go on, let me, let me give you some principles of what do we learn from this uh, from this first thing. Number one, never use these principles as a means to coerce or intimidate your partner into sex. You are sinning against God if you are trying to exercise force in order to, you know, force your spouse into a sexual relationship with you. You're actually destroying everything that it should be, which is something of freedom and love. And the nature of love is where you actually care for the other person more than you care for yourself. If you're unhappy with your sexual relationship with your spouse, don't demand enter into a conversation with your spouse. And let me uh, give you a little principle there. The worst time to have a conversation about sex is before, during, or after sex. All right? It's, uh, if, if you've just said no to your spouse and said, oh, I'd like to talk about our needs in sex, that's not a good time to talk about it because there's going to be a lot of hurt feelings. And if you've had kind of a, a lousy time of it, oh, hey, we need to talk about our sexual relationship. That's a terrible time to talk about it. When is the best time to talk about your sexual relationship? Any other time. All right? So here's the point. The time to talk about your relationship your sexual relationship with your spouse is at a time when your emotions aren't hopped up, you're not all angry or frustrated or hurt or scared or anything like that, but at a time when you're calm and it's a great time to bring it up to say, you know what, I would love to see us get back, or maybe we've never had a healthy sexual, sexual relationship, to get to a healthy sexual relationship, all right? Number three. Uh, if you are dealing with a partner who is hesitant or fearful, seek to understand why. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, if your spouse has had sexual trauma in the past, that could make it very difficult for them to respond in a free and joyful way to legitimate sex. That's one of the ways that Satan destroys people is by introducing sexual trauma into their life. So if that's happened and you're a spouse of somebody like that, boy, demanding has the opposite effect because it pushes that person back into the world that they came out of where sex was a weapon. Sex was a tool of violence. It was not a tool of love. I would encourage you, by the way, if that's happened to you and you've never told your spouse, wow, that's got to come out. And if you're the spouse 
and your husband or wife tells you that they've been raped or abused sexually, I don't know why, but so often, especially men have the weird reaction of getting angry at the spouse for being raped or abused. And this is an opportunity for you to be loving and caring and tender and allow her to talk through things. And I would encourage you, there, this is a place to get counsel, to um, bring this up with a godly couple or, or a godly counselor, someone who can help you work through this. Because these are, honestly, they're very difficult waters to navigate, but they can, you can come through them on the other side and have a wonderful sexual relationship. But it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of patience, and some work together, okay? Uh, sexual activity in marriage should be the norm. That's what we see ver with verse 5. Um, don't, uh, don't use it as a weapon. Don't demand it, but make it sometimes, make it a time when you two can be free together, okay? And only withhold by mutual agreement for the purpose of prayer or Right after a baby's born, people get a little sore, have a little patience and understanding there. Uh, that'll win you points in the future big time. <laughs> Wives, uh, four years after the baby's born, don't keep using that as an excuse, all right? <laughs> so, no, oh, I'm still so sore. No, it doesn't work at that point. <laughs> Communicate freely and often about your sexual needs. It is legitimate. And, I don't know if you've noticed this. I've, I've been counseling for over 30 years. I have never met a couple where they have the same level of sexual desires. It's crazy. Either, either the husband is here and the wife is here, or sometimes the wife is here and the husband is here, and I'm going, hey, why didn't you marry him and you marry her? But it's always seems like this. there's a, a difference in, in the drive to have sex. If you have that, don't consider yourselves weird. Consider yourselves absolutely 1,000% normal. It's, it's normal. And I think God kind of snickers at that because he doesn't do it to torment us. He does it to force us to communicate. All right? So it's, it's not, oh, you calling people names and things like that. It's, hey, let's talk about the fact, you know, I desire a sexual relationship far more often than you do, and, and that's okay, but let's talk about how we can work this out in a way that works for both of us. The giving and taking of communication actually enhances the sexual relationship more because you're not just two bodies coming together, you're two bodies, two souls, and two spirits coming together. And when you get sex right, it's wonderful. It's way better than anything the world could ever imagine. But if you have a difference in that desire, that's a great time to spend some time communicating about how you can work that out. Final thing, stay away from porn. All right? can you just make that a commitment if you're, if you're struggling in that area? I, it's, it's, unbelievable to me, but I've actually had Christians, Christian couples come in to me and say, is it okay if we use porn to stimulate our sex lives? And it's, I just, it's everything I can do to look at them like they're crazy. And so if you come to me and ask me that, I'll work very hard not to look at you like you're crazy, but I'll think you're crazy. <laughs> because porn is the worst example of healthy sex. It is two animals. You might as well be watching two dogs have sex because that's all it is. There's no human interaction. It's two animals having sex. There's no love. There's no joy. There's no intimacy. All it is is a physical act. And I'll tell you something. I've seen couples' sex lives ruined by pornography because one or the other gets all hooked up on a certain idea of what their sex should be and they're bored with sex because they want to do all of these exotic things and uh, it, it, it's very sad. So stay away from porn. Uh, I also want to encourage you 
what's, what's legitimate in a married sexual relationship? Anything that is mutually acceptable, okay? So the definition of what is righteous and unrighteous and loving and unloving is what is, are both members of the couple comfortable with. Again, no, no room for demanding or, or coercing or belittling or name calling in this area. All right, let's go on. So let's talk about celibacy again, verses seven through nine, or six through nine. Paul says, now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as, as I myself am, but as each has his own gift from God, one of, his, one of one kind and one of another, to the unmarried and widows, I say, it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. All right, so Paul was clearly unmarried. Uh, we actually know that at one time he was married because to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. So either Paul's wife died or more likely what, what I frankly believe is when he became a believer, his wife left him. And the reason I believe that is Philippians 3, Paul talks about the fact that he suffered the loss of all things for the sake of knowing Christ. I mean, when Paul became a Christian, he lost everything. And my personal view is that his wife was one of those uh, blessings that he lost. So uh, whatever, we know that Paul is single. And he's saying, I'm not going to give you guys a command because it's not my place to command this, but I just want to give you my opinion. I wish that everybody could be like I am because what Paul is saying is I have no worries about my wife. I can go and I can do uh, whatever the Lord calls me to do and I don't have to worry about a wife or children or anything like this. I can go do it. But he, but he says, I know that's not practical because so many people, if they were single, would be so obsessed with sexual desire that they couldn't serve the Lord. So that's why Paul says it's better to marry and serve the Lord as a couple than it is to burn up with lust. All right, so he's very, he's very realistic about this. But the point is, singlehood has advantage. The advantage of being single is you don't have any constraints to keep you from serving the Lord. Now, I want to tell you something. If you're single and you're using your time for self-indulgence, playing video games all night long or doing this or that or the other thing, doing things that are just wasting your time, you're blowing an incredible opportunity because you can involve yourself in serving the Lord like most of us married people can. I gotta ask Connie, can I go? No. Okay, so now, you know, <laughs> I have other things, but you can just go serve the Lord. So there's, there's a freedom, Paul says, to being single, and if you can handle it, go for it. Paul also says there is a gift of celibacy. Now, when I was single and we were young, we all prayed, oh, don't give me that gift, please. You know, and it's probably a good indication that we didn't have the gift. <laughs> all right? Because I, I have a young woman who's lived her whole life single. And she has been so aggressive in serving the Lord. It's been wonderful to see her life. And she's been happy and single. And that's a great thing. If you've got the gift of celibacy, you'll know it because you can be happy and single. Now some of us, the, the problem is our culture does not encourage singlehood, does it? Our, our culture looks like a, at you like you're half a person if you're single, and God says, no, you're whole. And if, if you are a person that has that ability to not be dominated by sexual desire, boy, have I got a job for you. So it's a great thing. So uh, let's go on now. And we're going to go to divorce. So what have we seen so far? Celibacy is good. Marriage is the norm. If you're married, one of your priorities is to fulfill the sexual needs of your spouse and to have a healthy sexual relationship. So now he goes and he's going to answer another question. Here's another thing that was bubbling up in the Corinthian church. There were people who said, don't get married and if you are married, get divorced so that you can be single again because you shouldn't be married in the first place. So now Paul in 10 and 11 is going to answer this. He says, to the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. So what Paul is saying 
By the way, is the Lord gave specific instruction on this when he was on earth. When he says a little later, not the Lord, but I, he's saying the Lord didn't talk specifically about this, but I, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, am going to give you instruction. So that's all that that little thing means. So I give this charge. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce her wife. Before we go on, let me just share, this is not the total teaching of Scripture on divorce. And I wish I had time to do a two-day conference on the biblical view of divorce and remarriage, but I don't. And let me just share with you what this Scripture is saying. Marriage is a relationship that is a covenant before God, and breaking that covenant should be the last possible resort of our lives. Paul says, if you're married, don't separate. And if you do, stay unmarried. Now, that does not negate the fact that other scriptures give biblical grounds for divorce that frees the person to remarry. In fact, Paul's going to talk about one of those here. So he's not saying, oh, if you get a divorce, you need to put a scarlet D on your shirt and wear it as a second-class citizen for the rest of your life. No. If you're here today and you're divorced, if you're here today and you're divorced and remarried, if you're here today and you're divorced and remarried and you didn't have biblical grounds for divorce, I have news for you. Jesus has already forgiven you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I would just grieve if Satan tried to use this message to bring back guilt or condemnation into your life because of things that you've done. Okay? Paul is saying here, look, if you're married, stay married. And I want to tell you something. There, there, there is a value to viewing yourself as stuck with your partner. Because when you view yourself as stuck with your partner, there's a certain desperation that creeps in that says, I don't want to be stuck miserably for the rest of my life. So we're going to work until we get this right, and then we're going to actually have a good marriage. So I hear so many people, do I have to stay married? I'm miserable. And so I ask them the question, do you have to stay married and miserable? No, the answer is no. You can get unmiserable in your marriage. And you say, well, you don't know my husband, you don't know my wife. And I, I, I can empathize with you. For the first seven years of our marriage, our marriage was a struggle. My prayer every day was, Lord, change my wife. <laughs> change Connie. If she would quit doing this and this and this and she'd start doing this and this and this, hey, it'd be great. And you know that's very human. We, we hate to accept responsibility, don't we? We hate to take a look in the mirror and say, hey, what am I doing that is disobeying God and wounding my spouse? Well, I didn't think that way. And finally, God got through to me and, and he got me to change my request. And I started acknowledging, God, this marriage is my fault. I'm the problem. And Lord, change me. And that little shift turned me from a victim to someone with enormous power. If you're waiting for someone else to change, how much power do you have? Zero. How much power do you have to bring change to your own life? In the Holy Spirit. Infinite. And I'll give you a little key. The change in our marriage happened when I started learning how to walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 25, if you need the passage. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. A whole bunch of good things, okay? Let me ask you a question. What do you think those qualities coming out of your life on a consistent basis would do to a marriage? Amazing. It doesn't guarantee your partner will change, your spouse. But what it does is it gives them the greatest chance to change. And I'll tell you something, our marriage transformed, it didn't get a little better, it transformed fundamentally 
in both the direction and the nature of the marriage. To where 43 years later, I have a marriage that literally I thank God for every day. Because outside of my relationship with Christ, it's the best possession I have. It's amazing. So if you're feeling bad about your marriage, don't give up hope because it always feels more hopeless than it is. All right. So let's look at principles. Uh, make divorce your last option. In fact, in Scripture, there are only a few reasons why divorce is permissible. But at the same time, if you're in a marriage where there's physical abuse going on, if you're in a marriage where there's serial ongoing adultery going on, if you're in a marriage where uh, the spouse has just said, I don't want to be a part of this anymore, uh, Paul actually is going to deal with that in a couple of minutes. Um, you don't have to feel like to please God you have to be stuck in that kind of an abusive relationship. Now, on the other hand, don't you dare pull out the God wants me happy card. Okay? And let me explain that. What I, several times I'll have people come and say, I want to get a divorce. Why? Well, I'm not happy and God wants me happy. And I have to tell them, well, I hate to say this, but in the universal agenda of God for the kingdom of God, your happiness does not rank number one. In fact, your obedience and bringing glory to God ranks a lot higher than your happiness. Now, here's the crazy little secret. The happiest people I know are people who live in obedience to God and bring glory to Him every day with their lives. Life isn't easy, but there's a fullness to life that comes when you're walking the rough road of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So, let me just tell you, it's not that I don't care about your happiness, it's that you're on the wrong path to find your happiness. All right. Number two is if you're struggling, find a mature couple. You know, it, it's amazing to, to find a couple who's got some scars from wars past and has learned how to navigate the waters of marriage and just meet with them. Just be with them to let them mentor you and, and help you through these, these tough waters. How does Jesus feel about marriage? Let me read to you Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. And the Pharisees came up to him, testing him, saying, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Remember, the Jews were always looking for a way out of God's best. Hey, can we get a divorce for this reason? And Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, shall cleave to, be glued to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. That's the end of his answer. Is it lawful? Jesus says, don't you know God's best? God's best is that the two become one, and once you're one, you never separate. Well, the Jews hated this answer. And so they said, well, why did Moses give a certificate of divorce? Why didn't Moses make divorce possible? And Jesus answered them, because of the hardness of your heart. In other words, the reason divorce is an option in this world is we are sinners, and even God's best of marriage can go so sideways. The only way to resolve that is to end the marriage. But that's not God's best. A couple of things jump out at me. You know what the disciples said after this? They said, then who can be married? See, the, the uh, great news to the disciples, this was a very humbling statement to them. They go, whoa, who, who can do this? To be stuck with one person for life? How can we possibly do this? So the bottom line that I take from that, marriage is hard, but it is worth it. Don't expect marriage to be easy. Don't expect everything to just work out nice and, 
and feel like expect that it will be a struggle to be the person God has called you to be, and it will be it'll be a struggle for your spouse to be the person God has called them to be. So, now Paul goes, and we're going to tie this together when we're done, but verses 12 through 16, what if you're married to an unbeliever? Again, this grows out of a question that the Corinthians had. They said, hey, the Old Testament said that if I'm married to a Gentile, a Jew is married to a Gentile, God commanded us to divorce them because being married to a Gentile actually made us unclean. So that's in Ezra chapter 3 if you're interested. So they're saying, wow, this is great. That means if I'm married to a non-believer, they're making me unclean and I can get a divorce. So that was the question. What should we do if we're married to a non-believer? Now, verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. Jesus never talked about this when he was on earth, so I'm talking now under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. So guys, you're married to a non-believing wife? Is she willing to live with you? Don't divorce her. We're going to explain why in just a minute. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce her. Now, he says, for the unbelieving husband, and I want to use the word sanctified, uh, a little bit more than made holy. I think made holy is a little unclear. He is sanctified because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified because of her husband. Now, this is so crazy, it's cool. In the old covenant, if you were married to a Gentile, that Gentile defiled you. In the new covenant, if you're married to an unbeliever, you sanctify the unbeliever. So Paul is saying, you actually have this positive influence on your family when you as a believer live an obedient life in a mixed faith family. In fact, he'll actually talk about the fact that you have a great opportunity to win your spouse to the Lord. So he, he goes on to say, Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are sanctified or holy because of your influence in the home. So before we go on, I don't really know what Paul means by the fact that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. All I know is it's good. Doesn't that sound good? If, if, if you have an unbelieving spouse and they are sanctified because of you, whatever that means, it kind of sounds like a good thing, right? So I, I can leave it at that. I don't have to necessarily define it because I have no idea what Paul means. I know that it doesn't mean they're saved because of you because each person has to make their own decision to follow Jesus. But it means that somehow there is this godly, sanctifying influence in the home when you live an obedient life, all right? Verse 15 now. But if an unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you sa will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, where you, whether you will save your wife? This is one of those situations where divorce is permissible. And in the case of divorce, remarriage is permissible. Paul says you are not bound to that previous marriage. You're free. All right? That's if they refuse to live with you and they want to separate, you're completely free. But Paul comes back again and says, wife, you have a chance to bring your husband to the Lord. Not by yakking at him. All right? I've never met a man or woman who has been nagged into the kingdom of heaven. All right? Go to church. Quit smoking. Quit drinking. Be a Christian. Okay? And that's such a lovely message. You know, it's just... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I want to accept that gospel. No. <laughs> Peter says to the wives, when you're married to a person who is not obedient to the word, they can be one without a word. Close your mouth and live godly. That'll shock your husband or wife so much, they'll probably become a Christian just because of that. <laughs> but, you know, so when you stop nagging them about what they're not and what they should be, and you're just loving them as Christ has called you to, that's the greatest witness you can possibly have. So, I want to I want to take you through. We're we're done. I just want to give you some takeaways as to what are the bottom lines because we've sort of been all over the place. So, 
Takeaway number one. Sex, sexual union is important and it's a wonderful part of a healthy marriage relationship. You guys, if... And boy, you know, kids are sex killers, aren't they? I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> I mean, isn't it? Uh, it's, you know, it's like... <sighs> yes. Number one, you're exhausted. Number two, your kid seems to know when you're having sex and they start screaming when you do that. <laughs> Maybe they hear you're screaming. I don't know, but, you know... <laughs> You know, soundproof your walls. It'll help a lot. But, I'm sorry. I just can't help myself sometimes. So I just, all right. Um, anyway, uh, back to serious. If you've, <laughs> back to serious, I say. Uh, if you've had trauma in your life, that makes sex something less desirable or even despicable to you, this is really important to talk about. Don't just passively, aggressively avoid. Say, hi, I need to let you know that I have a problem. And again, if, if, there, if there is sexual trauma or if there is previous sexual relationship, you need to understand that that makes establishing sexual union in marriage more difficult. Okay, sexual experience is not helpful for sex and marriage. It's actually hurtful, even if your previous experience is with the person that you're married to. Because you've done it wrong and it's hard to figure out how to do it right. Number two, if you're single, I want to encourage you to be very careful about igniting your sexual passions. In your relationships with the opposite sex, don't focus on romance. Don't focus on sexual satisfaction or pleasure. Focus on friendship. Focus on learning to communicate. Focus on learning to resolve conflict. Focus on being honest and authentic with each other because that makes adding the sex after marriage wonderful. So set your relationship up for a lifetime together. Don't set it up to get pleasure now because you'll ruin your pleasure later. You'll make it more difficult. All right. So, second for especially singles, and I think for married people too, be careful what you watch. There's a lot of junk on TV that is telling you everything wrong about sex. Do you know that? Guard your heart. And don't, if you're single, don't use your time for self-indulgence. Get busy serving Jesus. It actually gets kind of exciting when you do that. Third, Parents, teach your children the joy and the beauty and the normalcy of a healthy sexual relationship. Let your children see you kissing and holding and snuggling and doing all those things that they go, ew, you know, they, uh, it, it, but they go, ooh, with a smile, you know, they like it, even though they say they hate it. Let them see you showing affection to each other. Teach them. You guys, do you realize how under attack we are? Things like gender identity, all of the sexual stuff that's going on in schools, they're starting at kindergarten now. All right? So parents, that means we have to be ahead of the curve. So if your kid comes home with some obscene word, that's not the time to wash their mouth out with soap. See, when you freak out, the message to your kids is, whoa, mom and dad can't handle that. I'll never talk to them again, all right? So you take a nice deep breath and say, what an interesting word. <laughs> where, 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 where did you hear that? And then you can freak out with the other parent. That's all right. But, uh, but here's the thing. Your kids need to hear from you or they'll learn from others. Okay? There's no third option. There, there's no healthy way they're going to learn about sex if they don't learn about it from you. So don't depend on the church. Don't depend on the school. Certainly don't depend on the school. And don't depend on their friends. And don't depend on cable TV. 
all right? So those are four really bad places to learn about sex. There's only one good place for them to learn, and that's from you guys. If you're divorced, you're forgiven, all right? You didn't need me to say that, but I just need to reinforce to you, Satan loves to condemn us, and he loves us to live in condemnation and guilt. So don't go back and, oh, I blew it. I'm, I'm second-class Christian from now on. No, you're forgiven. If you're considering divorce, always view it as your last resort. Seek help, seek counsel, seek getting together with other people. And work hard to make your marriage something wonderful. The great thing is, you guys, is God loves you and he wants you to have a marriage, if you're married, that is so deeply satisfying intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and sexually. And if you've drifted apart, you're going to be amazed at how that sex, it's just, oh, it's such a wonderful glue for the relationship. But it has to be something where men you are seeking to bring pleasure to your wife, and wives, you are seeking to bring pleasure to your husbands. It's a great thing. We're going to call up the uh, um, uh, worship team. I know it's kind of weird going from sex to worship, but it's actually a great, wonderful, normal transition. <laughs> but what I want to encourage you to do, if, if you're here today, and you're single, and you're married, and you just feel like you're off track with where God wants you to be. This is a great time to come up and ask for prayer from the people who are up here to pray for you. Um, as you're taking communion, it's a great time, again, as single or as a married person, to renew your understanding of grace and let God speak into your heart right now. And then we have the offering. It's a great time to be generous to this church because they are taking your money seriously and they are spending it wisely for the kingdom of God. So the cans over there are for the, um, for the offering and it's for your chance to uh, really support what God is doing here at Ansem. God bless you.